Hey everybody, this is Tim from Tone Menders. Before we get into this episode, I want to tell you about something really cool going on in the sound community. Do you need an audio gift for this winter? Well, the Field Recording Slack is giving away a free sports sound library with every donation to a selected kids' sports organization. Sporting opportunities aren't always equally accessible or available across communities. So join us this winter in giving kids the gift of play. From 45 different international sound recordists, you get 526 audio files covering over 25 different sports. Available only for a limited time. For more details, navigate to this episode's page at ToneBendersPodcast.com and you'll find everything you need to know there. Okay, on to the episode. You know what we should do? What's that? Go camping again in the mountains and shoot ourselves some fresh elk liver. Cook it right there on the coals, like Bronco Henry taught us. You got a sore gut? No. You act like it pains you to hit the two words together. Welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim and I will be your host for today. I was lucky enough to see an advanced screening of the new Jane Campion film, The Power of the Dog. This film takes place in the early 1900s on a ranch in Montana and it has the feel of a western, but there are no horse chases or massive shootouts. The characters find ways to hurt each other that are much worse than bullet wounds. Starring Benedict Cumberbatch as an almost unspeakably vile human being, the film sets a mood of foreboding early on and keeps that tone through clever sound design. For the most part, it's a quiet film, but each sound we hear really counts. Joining us today from Australia are two of the film's sound architects. First up, we have Tara Webb. Tara was a sound effects editor and the re-recording mixer on Power of the Dog. Tara, looking at your IMDb credits, you seem to have a ton of sound editing and sound design credits, but only recently, re-recording mixer credits have started to pop up. Can you tell me how that's been going? It's been going well. I guess it's one of those things where I have been doing it for a little while, but then you only then kind of start getting the credits a bit later on and stuff. So I, I have been kind of pre-mixing and that kind of thing for a few years now um, and then kind of took the leap to officially be <laughs> mixing. And it's been good. It's, it's terrifying. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I really, really, really enjoy the sound side of everything coming together and stuff. I mean, when I first started, I was very lucky as an assistant to be always involved in the mix and get to see it all come together. So it was always my favourite. I'm not great at uh, the kind of managing the room kind of thing. So I do, I do, I am still working on that a lot. But uh, but it's good. It's fun. It's um, challenging, but I like a challenge. So I can say she's very good at working the room and she is incredible at um, making decisions and listening to the people in the room, the directors and the producers. Oh, she's excellent you. as a mixer. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. That voice you just heard was Leah Katz. She was the dialogue supervisor on Power of the Dog. Leah's past credits include The King, The Nightingale, Peter Rabbit 1 and 2 and Mortal Kombat. All films that Tara worked on as well. How long have you two been working together? A long time. A long time. <laughs> yeah, a long time. Um, yeah, Tara and I have been working together for a while now. Very lucky to be able to work with her because she's um, fabulous. Likewise. Uh, <laughs> we both started out with a supervisor named Andrew Plain who really supports women and um, has always mentored editors straight out of uni mm -hmm. uh, and so I got my start with him and then I was still working with him when Tara started up a few years later. Uh, yeah and then we've been we've worked on quite a few projects together. We, we do freelance so we don't always do the same projects but um, I always do love when I get to work with Leah because she's awesome and a great dialogue editor too. We make a good team. <laughs> So Tara, as the re-recording mixer on Power of the Dog, wh what food groups were you in charge of mixing? Uh, so I was mixing the effects, um, foley and backgrounds, and Rob uh, McKenzie was doing the dialogues and music. 
You were also a sound effects editor on the film as well. So do you enjoy mixing stuff that you've cut? I do. Like, it definitely makes it easier because I know where the sounds are on the different tracks and stuff. I mean, I do also love being able to mix other people's work as well. Like, for instance, um, being able to mix Dave Whitehead's stuff was just awesome um, because he's just such an amazing sound designer. It's also nice to then have a different perspective. So having someone else cut, then I can maybe bring something to it that they haven't thought of and vice versa when they cut things that I wouldn't think to do as well. It's the same when I also then do sound effects editing. I love passing it on to another mixer so that they can bring their own perspective to it. So I understand that there were massive storms during the shooting of this film. So the, can you explain where the film was shot? It takes place in Montana, but it wasn't shot there. And maybe Leah, talk about how the production tracks arrived to you for your dialogue edit. Yeah, so it was shot in New Zealand on a mix of locations and sets. Richard Flynn, the sound recordist, did an amazing job of miking it. He had really good booms. He had radio mics on everyone. So so he managed the locations really well. I believe that the sets were even harder than, than the locations because they weren't soundproofed. So there was traffic and birds on those scenes. But really, it, it came to me very clean and um, had a lot of material to work with. He also did a lot of amazing wild tracks with the crowds, scenes. Um, so he had a lot of coverage. Of course, the radio mics sometimes weren't perfect just because of costumes. Um, in particular with one character, there wasn't a lot of frequency on it. So that didn't mean it wasn't useful. I use auto aligns. So I find that even if there's just a little bit of bass in the radio mic, it can give a lot of body to the boom and it's all really helpful. What kind of noise reduction techniques and tools were you using? So I use RX mainly. RX9 wasn't available at the time, so uh, RX8. Always cautious to not overprocess things. Uh, keep the original underneath on the track at the mix. It might sound okay in the studio, but sometimes once you get to the mix, it just it sounds overprocessed. So I'm careful with it. I don't use it too much. Um, with declicking, I might do very fine work, but I still like to do it the old way of, you know, just repairing the waveform uh, manually as opposed to using anything too destructive. So Tara, this film has a, not a ton of dialogue. There's a lot of scenes that uh, I sit just kind of dialogue lists, if you will, but there's lots of sound still happening, even though it's quiet, subtle sounds. How did you go about filling in all the soundtrack around the words without having to be able to put in kind of massive sounds of any kind? It's mostly winds and creaks in the house. I guess at the very beginning of the process, we spoke with Jane about how each of the locations would have their own character. The house, for instance, would be, wanted it to be quite cold and oppressive, so um, Dave Whitehead, he laid up these beautiful kind of creaks and moans that we used throughout the house. And then we would just pick moments between the dialogue to emphasise those creaks. And, you know, so we wouldn't have a bed of creaks running throughout the entire scene. We would just find those moments in between the dialogue to add to that um, tension. And sometimes Jane would, there might be a moment where we didn't have one and Jane would say, oh, during the mix, can we put one in there or vice versa, take one out. Um, so it was all very specifically designed to add to the drama. How did you divide up the work between uh, Dave Whitehead and yourself? So initially, just as a simple kind of start, we split up the reels. Dave took a few reels and I took a few reels. Um, and then there were specific sound design elements and moments that then Dave um, took on himself. So particular things like Phil's boots, the vehicles. Dave actually um, got access to the location cars that were used on set, which is awesome um, to be able to have access to them. And he went out and did it, I think, you know, it was nearly a week or a few days um, perhaps of, of recording those cars, which really made a difference um, to the soundtrack. Yeah, we've interviewed Dave a few times for this podcast, and he's always been an absolute delight. You mentioned the footsteps of the main character. They are sometimes super loud, almost to the point that they are part of his actual character and his being, his foley. When you were mixing that, how did you experiment of how far to push that foley up front? Yeah, I mean, there were definitely times where we did take it too far and then had to bring it back. 
we knew right from the beginning that Foley would play a really important part in the film, so much so that then Dave, our sound designer, took on some of those elements as well to give a sound design element to it. So a lot of the time I spent in the premix was actually um, working on the Foley and the effects as well as the location um, because Phil's boots, again, I know we've spoken about them a lot, but they do play a very important um, role. The location of Phil's boots actually sounded fantastic. They had this really nice weight to them. And then um, there were also Foley elements that we sometimes used as well as Dave's spur sounds, which is my favourite sound in the film, which really added to that character. Um, so it was about, I spent a lot of time, not just with Phil's boots, but other things as well, seeing what worked, where we had all three playing together. And sometimes that was a bit too much. So then we would strip it back and maybe just go with the location or maybe just go with the sound design or, or just the Foley. And then, um, yeah, we just had to be careful because we still really wanted it to feel real and natural. Um, so it was about pushing it to the point just where it was still in that um, kind of area of believable. Yeah, because it's, it's tricky. It's not like our 80s or 90s Hollywood film where you want everything to be like crystal clear and really easy for the audience. It still had to be believable um, mm -hmm. and had, have that organic feel to it um, without feeling cluttered. So everything was really considered and selected because Jane had a really clear vision of what she wanted and she was really good at making those decisions with us. Everything had to have a purpose on the soundtrack. There wasn't anything just thrown in. So you mentioned Jane, the director Jane Campion. How involved is she in the audio process? Does she leave you be or is she sitting in on every day of the mix? She was very involved, especially with the, the dialogue and the drama which Leah can then talk more about. Um, we obviously had early discussions about how the different locations and environments would sound. Also, before we started mixing, Jane came in and we sat down and went through the sound effects and the foley and the backgrounds. Um, so she, and we went through it every reel. So she had heard everything by the time we got to the mix. So there were no surprises. And it was during that time sitting with her that the location of the ranch in Montana and how she really wanted that kind of expanse feel and it was more about stripping back and just having a few select but right sounds and, and keeping them up the front rather than having the, a lot of sound in the surrounds for those particular exteriors. Yeah, and in the dialogue department she was also really involved. We spent a lot of time going over the dialogue track after I had done my first pass on it and deciding what needed ADR um, her also being the writer of the script meant that she could um, write additional lines. There were a lot of additional lines for the cow hands and anything we needed to change in the dialogue. She could write the line that was true for the character and true for the period easily. It was amazing to have her so involved. It's funny that you say that because before I saw the film, I didn't know a lot about it. And I, I knew it was made by Jane Campion, shot in New Zealand, and starred Benedict Cumberbatch. So when everyone started speaking with American accents, it kind of threw me for a loop. How do you feel about working on uh, something from a country that you're not necessarily familiar with in a time period you're not familiar with as a dialogue editor? Do you feel like there, you are uh, tempted to take out mannerisms, to leave in mannerisms maybe that you're not used to? Yeah, it's tricky because I don't know a true Montana accent, but we had dialect coaches to help us through. Uh, they supervised on the ADR sessions and checked the whole film through to make sure that we were true to the accents and the time. And then we did some research and, you know, things like OK. There was a lot of OKs in the film, which had to be removed because it's not a term that you use in 1925. So, I mean, my writing skills are poor, so any of my suggestions were probably thrown out pretty early. But... Um, we had a lot of additional dialogue in that we had all the cow hands. Um, they were largely silent on location. They had a few lines to create that world at the ranch because there's so little there. You really just have those um, cow hands and the character of the house to create that world. And the world of the toxic masculinity was a fragile one because the cow hands aren't necessarily vile, horrible 
people either. They're just following in Phil's footsteps and Phil's footsteps are from a generation before of the same. So it's just like this thing that keeps on passing on. And so it was also a really fine line as to how we handled the cow hands and how they reacted to things. And if they were too mean, it wasn't right. But if they were too nice, it wasn't right. They had to be just the right amount of laughter or the right amount of um, mockery to show that Phil was leading this. They weren't leading it. Well, there's a scene in the movie where the younger male character walks kind of through all of the farmhands while they're eating, I guess. And he walks kind of in between them all and they're all heckling him as he goes by. Was that on set or was that loop group? That was a combination of wild tracks and loop group. That's my favorite. And it was my favorite um, sequence in the first screening that we saw. I remember talking to Tara after we saw it for the first time and we were just, I was so excited about it. I was excited about the sound of his jeans and um, Tara was too. <laughs> we, were, we were excited about it because they'd put in a little bit of a temp sound and that was improved obviously by the effects people. But this sequence, which was so cool, like him walking through those men and, you know, just the, the sound of his jeans. <laughs> it was just that confidence, like regardless of how he should have soaked his jeans or not, <laughs> he he didn't care. He just walked through them and it was like that was a really powerful moment for me. It was a major turning point for me. I was like, cool, it's it's a sound moment, and that was exciting. Yeah, for listeners who haven't seen the film, uh, the sound of his jeans is a plot point. That's just kind of a weird thing to comment if you haven't seen the film yeah. yet. <laughs> sound of his jeans and, and his comb. <laughs> yeah, there's all these lovely little details that... And he has a lisp, and, and in ADR we had to um, exaggerate that too because that's important. Um, so that the lisp was added. I think those details were really enhanced. Absolutely. By us. Cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> no way. That's staying in. That's staying in. Um, another scene I'd like to explore while we have you is uh, there's a scene early in the film. The Benedict Cumberbatch character has uh, cleared out the restaurant by being rude to all of the other characters patrons and then uh, embarrass the Peter character so that he's run away and his brother is left in the restaurant alone and there's various things happening off screen from uh, another character crying in another room but there's also just every once in a while you're hearing dogs barking in the surrounds and it's really effective and it makes you feel the space but it also kind of adds an emotion to the scene. Dave laid up those dogs for that scene and then um, we may have just like in the during the mix Jane may have then picked moments where she would be like, actually, I want to hear a dog there and, and that kind of thing to just, you know, emphasise the points that she wanted. But yeah, the dogs are great. When we talk to people on this podcast about mixing and surround or Atmos, it's normally in the context of an Avengers film or a, a war film, uh, much like Hacksaw Ridge that, uh, Tara, you worked on. In this film, it's there's lots going on in the surrounds, but it's a much more subtle mix. How do you build those surround mixes? I think I approached it similar to how Dave and I then approached laying up the sounds once we, you know, kind of got the feedback from Jane, which was stripping back a lot. So I think it was then just more about picking specific moments. So, you know, whether it was... Um, a specific kind of wind gust that then, you know, went up on the, the ceiling or the, the surrounds. And, um, and also, you know, we used the, for Atmos, we used Phil's boots through the house sometimes to kind of create that tension in the space of the house. <laughs> I'm not great at the, uh, in terms of the technical terms, but I just kind of do it Instinct. how I, like, yeah, just yeah. how it, it feels right. Like, yeah. you know, if, and I'll just put it, somewhere and then I'll be like oh okay no that's feeling a bit too heavy back here now and then just you know again a lot of the time I just do stuff until I, I feel like it feels right and then I'm like, okay if it feels right I move on and then you know I might come back and, and change something but um, that's generally how I approach it. Yeah I mean it's obvious when you're working on a film that's already made you look at it and you go it's pretty clear this is a wide expanse, right? So mm. you knew that the the atmospheres and the experience had to be wide, but it's also very focused. So it was like, I remember during the mix, it was like the panning was cool and then sometimes the panning needed to be pulled back in yeah. because we needed to keep the focus in the centre yeah. um, and on the details. So it was like that, that compromise, but to still create that width because it's so cinematic visually. 
like Tara and Dave did this incredible job creating these beautiful landscapes and spaces where there's not a lot there's no you know to work with so it's like a beautiful bed of winds and gusts and delicate sounds it was really spectacular yeah I think the vast majority of people are going to end up seeing this on Netflix I was lucky enough to see it in a theater and you really did feel like you were within this wild lands uh, of Montana. It, I thought that the surround, the use of the mix and the surrounds was really effective. It was really well done. Yeah, it's tricky because, like, you mix it for, like, Tara and Rob mixing it for a cinema when you know it's largely going to be watched on Netflix. It's like, do you focus on the Netflix experience or the cinema experience? We also knew it was going to be doing a lot of festival runs. Um, We already knew, I think, that it was in Venice before we had started mixing. So we knew it had to work beautifully in a theatre. You know, it will work beautifully on television (laughs) as well. (laughs) But they're quite different things, you know. Like a dialogue track for a cinema experience is so different for a TV experience because what can sound good on TV doesn't necessarily work very well coming out of the centre speaker in a cinema. Um, I mean, the near field mix did actually translate quite well yeah. Like when doing the near field mix. There wasn't a lot we had to then change. Right. Um, it did actually work pretty well, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, final question for you before we let you go. The main character, as I mentioned in the intro, Phil, is a horrible, despicable person throughout the film. Did you use any sound to try and emphasize that? One thing that maybe came to my mind while watching it was the sound of his spurs. But was there anything else that maybe you emphasized for him? Uh, I mean, yeah, the the boots, the spurs was definitely the, the the main thing. I mean, any kind of scene that we had with Phil, we would, especially when he was by himself, we would definitely kind of go a bit more into detail like there's this cloth scene and with the saddle and that kind of thing where we really um, emphasized on the the foley and the detail but particularly for his menacing character and to kind of torment the other characters in the film it was definitely the use of his boots as the main kind of drive well he was terrifying and i hated him <laughs> i know it's funny right? actually because um jane actually pulled back on how pl- unpleasant he was um, she didn't want to put people off him too early. So actually the True. opening scene, we did ADR to reduce how unpleasant he was. That's right, yeah. Because she didn't want you to hate him from the get-go and wanted it to be more complex. So while he had a lot of weight, I think that's what's so interesting about his character is that he's sort of human by the end of it um, or not to give anything away. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, that's the journey of the film. It's what makes it so good. Yeah. Was Phil's whistling ADR or location? The whistling was location. Um, The banjo, which could have been location, because he did excellent banjo, Um but it was re-recorded with an incredible banjo player. Yeah, that was fantastic. That. Yeah. He just just did it. It was all like one take. Yeah. <laughs> just when he would do, saw Phil doodling, he would just doodle straight straight with it and it would just fit right in. Yeah, incredible. And Kirsten Dunst, that's all her piano work as well. She didn't know how to play piano, um, but learnt for this project. Incredible. So thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. No, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure. Yes. <laughs> Film Beggars is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H, or leave us a tip. Just go to ToneBendersPodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. Are you looking for more audio-related podcasts to listen to? ToneBenders is part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. Tell me.
me a bit about the scene in Sydney for Audio Post. Is there a lot of work going on there? Uh, I'm obviously on the other side of the planet, and I'm not overly familiar with what it's like working there. Um, it's been pretty good, like, uh, at least for us, um, in terms of with COVID and everything, um, we've been pretty lucky that we've had consistent work throughout. We didn't have to, you know, because obviously there were productions that shut down and, and that kind of thing, but the good thing of being in post is that um, a lot of stuff had already been shot. So we were able to keep working. Um, and then fortunately, when I thought things might get pretty quiet because of the earlier shutdowns, um, other things came in. So the industry is going really well. Um, the, yeah, Austra the Australian industry is really great. We've got lots and lots of content. Um, uh, yeah, it's booming. Um, so there's right now, I think there's more work than... Yeah. Then we can manage, <laughs> which is a great position 